After Kirby's Dreamland's surprising success on the Game Boy, it was only a matter of time until the little endeavor for beginners should turn into a full series with countless titles in the future. Kirby's adventure for Nintendo's first home console should continue the franchise with meaningful ideas such as Kirby's trademark skill of copying enemies' abilities, and further increase the general scope thanks to the increased hardware power of the NES. Naturally, it's not only the visuals or gameplay that should benefit from the jump to a better platform which is why we're going to take a look at every boss and determine if they developed in their power as well. Since the remake does not change any bosses besides lowering the difficulty, I decided to put Adventure and Nightmare Dreamland together. It's hard to start with Wispy by mentioning the tradition of fighting this classic foe always before encountering more mighty opponents. But you have to be aware, there's no pattern, with no tradition. Because Wispy worked so well as the first boss, the creators decided to simply repeat the battle. From Dreamland again, with no substantial changes to the core design. The only main difference is the opportunity to use copy abilities, which is a bigger contrast than you might think. In Dreamland, there was no chance to consistently deal damage and plainly wait until you inhale an apple and strike back. In Adventure, you can end the clash in mere seconds, downplaying the whole premise and making Wispy easier than he needs to be. They could have circumvented this issue by adding at least one more dangerous attack that forces you to retreat once you stick too long to Wispy's face. Or just like in Dreamland, take damage when touching his face. For the first home console title of the series, it might be a little disappointing. But luckily, there are going to be other new bosses, handling the balance between base Kirby and copy abilities more formidable. Similar to Wispy, King DDD remained almost completely unchanged and is the supposed to be final boss of the game. To name the only new addition to his toolkit immediately, the king himself goes even more after his rival and can now inflate himself to slowly chase after Kirby. Initially, it sounds like an easy skill to dodge and is surely not as grand as any other potential fresh technique could be, but you have to time the trajectory of his movement and accordingly jump. As I stated, the rest stood the same, with both versions of the game even offering an easier boss than in the original Dreamland thanks to a wider stage and adventure and generous simplification in Nightmare in Dreamland. However, what gives DDD the edge over Wispy is the better synergy with copy abilities. The king doesn't become a cakewalk with his skill. In fact, it can even be arguably harder, depending on which ability you use. DDD's sudden inhale becomes much more dangerous since you have to come relatively close and most skills are not as refined as today, hence feeling quite troublesome to use in a fast-paced battle like this. There's a balance how you want to approach the fight and because this is only the entrance to the true final boss, King DDD serves his purpose perfectly fine. Krako is another lucky boss being transported to the first home console title and unlike Wispy or DDD, at least adds one rather substantial addition to his encounter even incorporating a specific copy ability, something you do not often see even in modern titles. Before going to the actual fight, Krako escapes to the horizon with Kirby following him either by floating or using the high jump ability. Not only does it utilize Kirby's new talent, but adds a little platforming challenge. Again, something not as apparent as you would think in the series. For my taste, it's a little too short and somehow could be expanded to be the whole clash, but constitutes as a charming first phase. The second the second half doesn't differentiate itself too much from Dreamland, in fact, it's again basically the same, but you should underline the thrill of having all of those bosses on the at this time big screen and in full colors. The first duo boss in the game, Mr. Shine and Bright, resemble the horizon and act together while making use of their specialities. 
technically you do not fight both opponents at the same time due to the fact how one of your foes remains in the background, only supporting his partner. This gives the fight a unique twist since it's not the same as the twins in Dreamland. Additionally, it also prevents you from simply flying above every obstacle, since the resting enemy in the sky still damages when being touched. With the increased hardware power this time, there's even the appreciated detail of a day and night shift depending on which enemy you're currently fighting. The attacks per se are nothing to gosh about, as you will have an easy time with or without copy abilities, and I particularly enjoy how Mr. Shine and Bright follow the trend of resampling very simplistic yet charming character designs, akin to the boss design Dreamland basically founded. Just like many other Nintendo franchises, Kirby didn't necessarily establish a clear villain in Dreamland since it was only the first adventure and there should be plenty chances left to experiment with different styles of adversaries. As a dark matter of fact, it wasn't as obvious as you might think to have a true final boss after DDD, since you could easily see the creators merely reusing what worked before. Furthermore, especially back in the day, platformers were quite forward in their approach, so having a twist villain in the form of Nightmare must have been quite the surprise, with DDD trying to stop you from releasing this evil magician onto the world. Being defeated, Kirby grabs the powerful Star Rod and ascends to the skies for a unique shot. Down. During the first phase, the game turns into a shmup, similar to the fight against Kabula in Dreamland, but with one essential twist to the difficulty. Clashing against Nightmare's yet to be revealed true form is not much of a challenge itself, but there's a time limit you're not informed about. Once the screen slowly reaches the bottom, Kirby's going to be crushed and you have to start from the beginning. It isn't as urgent as it sounds and only a commendable addition to give the climax a certain sense of tension. Once you reveal Nightmare's final form, it's time to shift the main event to the ground and start the last struggle. Your enemy mainly uses quick projectiles and teleports all over the place to remain unpredictable. As mighty as the Star Rod might be, it cannot simply deal damage as before, and you have to shoot for Nightmare's inner body which will be revealed, especially if your opponent is either assaulting or preparing something. The Star Rod itself feels like the perfect representation of gaining one of Kirby's standard skills, spitting out projectiles as a copy ability and since you don't have to inhale any star bits or other objects for a chance to attack. It basically enhances one of base Kirby's tame abilities into a strong copy ability and gives you an adequate feeling of experiencing the climax without being overpowered. Watching other Kirby boss rankings of mine, it's not so strange to think I have something against Meta Knight battles in general. But this is actually the first time the Lonely Knight appeared in a Kirby entry and left enough of an impression to become one of the franchise's greatest characters. Throughout the game you consistently encounter Meta Knight briefly when he's handling you an item or to fight his companions. Although he might give off the impression of a villain, it's more like a rivalry to test Kirby's strength and prepare him for what is to come. This is reflected in the fight itself as Meta Knight offers you a sword to even the odds and start a fast duel you haven't seen in the adventure before. Your opponent might appear like no threat thanks to a small body but is all the quicker on his feet and therefore harder to hit. Especially the original title presents an extremely difficult challenge and it's safe to say that Meta Knight most likely is the hardest boss in the game. Each hit you deal is accompanied by a clear effect and it feels very satisfying to swing your sword against such a tricky foe. Many of those intricacies are sadly gone in Nightmare Dreamland thanks to the general decrease of difficulty but is obviously compensated with the playable knight himself after the campaign. What's even more is how Meta Knight is perfectly designed around the idea of copy abilities in mind, being based completely around Sword Kirby. Surprisingly enough, with Krakow as another example, Adventure and its remake try to directly build some bosses around the idea of distinct skills, something you do not see too often in modern titles, which is why Meta Knight's debut is still one of the greatest showdowns.
The second boss is the second most convincing enemy due to his special ability of fighting with secondary means. Paint Roller is the artist behind the dangerous art pieces with four offensive bastions at each corner of the arena. There are more than enough opportunities to create all sorts of traps. Unlike with Wispy, Paint Roller doesn't stand still and moves consistently to each corner. Sometimes at such a speed, it can become quite hard to counterattack or even dodge his dashes. Despite the fact this is only a NES game in the original, there's still details like a small wall jump and the overall quality of the animations is unexpectedly expressive. The same goes for the remake with its charming pixel art style, mirroring the artistic expertise the boss portrays. This is also reflected in Paint Roller's attacks, creating different obstacles that target Kirby directly or simply float around, perfectly to inhale and strike back. Regarding how this is the first Kirby game with copy abilities, there's surprisingly enough not a specific skill to counter your opponent, but Ball Kirby especially fits perfectly into this battle, thanks to missing bottomless pits. During the regular game, it's quite hard and gimmicky to make proper use of the ball since the controls turn into a mess once you started to fully bounce through the area. In this closed arena, there are no moments to lose control and Paint Roller can be heavily overwhelmed with the proper usage. What cements his placement is the unique setup of the boss himself. By creating different kind of hazards in combination with his agility, the whole scenario is quite unseen in comparison to all the other bosses, especially to the first Dreamland. Today, with bosses like Adeline or Modern Equivalent, that built on a similar foundation, this idea could be regarded as boring, especially when not painting proper enemies. But back in the day, it was an unexpected turn of events, and Paint Roller definitely deserves to give his skills in a proper modern title another shot. Just like Paint Roller, an unforeseen enemy for the second entry and first auto-scroller boss in the franchise. Heavy Maul is a heavy working underground machine, equipped with two giant circular saws to bury through the earth. With only one rocket to shoot from his back, the boss himself doesn't actually participate in the battle too much, since he is too busy creating the battleground you find yourself in. To this day, even in consideration of modern titles, I regard this setup as one of the most memorable premises in the series, since there's not really a similar encounter you could compare it to. The speed of Heavy Maul varies throughout the fight and depending how fast or slow he moves, you have to be very careful not to get swallowed by the auto-scrawler. Also, whenever your foe goes up, naturally there are bottomless pits to fall into, so although Heavy Mo lacks an offensive power, he makes up for the weakness by playing with the arena. This fight becomes especially tough without any copy abilities due to the fact you cannot float, hence increasing the challenge whenever you have to catch up. But even with the skill equipped, it's not like the machine becomes a cakewalk. As mentioned many times before, now the remake is significantly easier, which is why I prefer the original and the clunkiness of the copy abilities. Whatever battle style you choose, Heavy Maul offers way more than you would think initially. And just like with Paint Roller, I would gladly battle this construct once again someday. Kirby's Adventure is a more than worthy successor to its handheld beginnings and makes great use of the additional hardware power to offer some memorable confrontations. The same goes for Nightmare in Dreamland, which prioritizes accessibility and a gorgeous pixel art style used in following titles. Depending on what you want to experience, both versions fulfill their role more than enough, and it's going to be interesting to see how the next remake is working with its blueprint.